Well, good evening. Uh, once again, my name is Ms. Thane Hugeliza, and tonight I have the immense pleasure of moderating tonight's event titled, quote, Black Arabic, a conversation on Arabic dialects in Sub-Saharan Africa, sponsored by the MENA Forum and the Center for Contemporary Arab Studies at uh, Georgetown University. Tonight's conversation aims to critically engage with the question of why so many sub-Saharan African varieties of Arabic remain largely absent in Arabic language and culture instruction. Examples of some of the languages we will be discussing tonight include, but aren't limited to, Sudanese Arabic, South Sudanese Juba Arabic, Chadian Arabic, Hassaniya Arabic, among others. By the end of the event, it is my hope that this discussion will positively broaden our conceptions of the Arabic speaking world by shedding light onto these oftentimes unacknowledged varieties of Arabic found throughout the African continent. As such, tonight's conversation will deal with a plethora of important themes from race, anti-Black racism, colonialism, decolonialism, language politics, etc. I understand that some individuals may take issue with the event's title, i.e. Black Arabic, as opposed to African Arabic. It is in the language that we use in speaking about North Africa and Sub-Saharan Africa, where we find a lot of our unacknowledged uh, racial biases. I'm aware that Africa includes the northernmost African countries, such as Morocco, Algeria, Egypt, etc. However, this conversation aims to discuss the invisibility of varieties of Arabic found in Bilada Sudan or Sub-Saharan Africa, and is further complicated by histories of enslavement during the period of the Trans-Saharan slave trade. I would like to add that this is not a linguistics debate. I do not claim to be a trained linguist, but rather a graduate student with significant personal and academic interest in tonight's topic of discussion. My sole role tonight is to facilitate a friendly academic conversation with two individuals who have demonstrated that they have given significant thought to the topic at hand through a variety of mediums, such as filmmaking and research. Before we get into questions I have prepared for tonight's guest speakers, I would like to share a little bit more about myself and what inspired me to create this event. My name is Nisreen, and I'm a first year graduate student in the MA in Arab Studies program at the Walsh School of Foreign Service at Georgetown University. My research interests pertain to exploring the history and development of anti-Blackness in the Middle East and North African region, and how this legacy impacts the lives of Sub-Saharan African refugees and asylum seekers today. Like many individuals, my desire to learn Arabic was motivated in large part by the urge to embark in self-exploration, to connect with my roots, and most importantly, communicate with my family members in South Sudan. My parents were born in Meridi, South Sudan, but spent most of their formative years in the capital of Juba. During this time, pre-2011, that is, Modern Standard Arabic was used as the main medium of instruction in schools throughout Sudan and the southern region. Outside of the formal classroom, Juba Arabic, uh, an Arabic-based Creole, is used to communicate across South Sudan's multi-ethnic populations. Civil strife between the Arab elite government of Khartoum and non-Arab populations of the southern region of Sudan would result in two civil wars the second of which prompted my family to seek refuge in Lebanon and then later become resettled in the United States. Like many children of immigrants and refugees, my parents wanted us to assimilate into American society quickly. For them, English language acquisition therefore offered a fast-tracked way to being fully American so that no one would have ever known we were fleeing from a civil war of near genocidal proportions. Although well-intentioned, my parents' desire for their children to speak English added to the fact that we spent the first seven years of our time in the U.S. in rural Tennessee meant that my siblings and I were not encouraged to be bilingual in Arabic and English. So I took it upon myself to change that. 
In my sophomore year of undergrad, I took my very first Arabic class. The class used Al-Kitab, a widely used Arabic language textbook. I was excited to have the opportunity to study the language that my parents took um, and studied in school. However, after a few weeks, I became increasingly aware of a number of pedagogical issues in Arabic language instruction that had nothing to do with my professor, but all had to do with the textbook we were using. What I mean is, besides the fact that I learned how to say, my father works at the United Nations and my mother works at the Office of Admissions at New York University within the first two weeks in a beginner's level Arabic class. I realized that Arabic language learning textbooks like Al-Kitab don't reflect me in any way. First, textbooks like these tend to conflate the Arabic speaking world with the Arab world a false dichotomy that fails to encompass the vast geography of the Arabic-speaking world, especially countries south of the Saharan Desert. Secondly, language learning tools like Al-Kitab offer very little racial, ethnic, or religious diversity, whether in their content or in the characters that they portray, therefore leaving very little room for people who share my identity as Black, African, and Christian with virtually no representation. Thirdly, students have the option to learn Egyptian or Levantine Arabic alongside modern standard Arabic. For those who are unaware of how Arabic language instruction operates, generally speaking, students learn modern standard Arabic or MSA, a standardized form of the language used in education, literature, and mass media. Because MSA is generally reserved for formal settings, students often learn a regional or national dialect in addition to MSA. These languages are more used for everyday communication between individuals in Arabic speaking communities. However, the extent to which Arabic language instruction incorporates a spoken dialect, these are usually reduced to the Egyptian and Levantine dialects of Arabic. Granted, there are a number of factors that go into one's desire to learn a particular dialect, such as country or region of interest, personal connection, the identity of the professor, and even um, political economic situations of countries that often prevent students from being able to travel safely to these countries in the first place. However, in privileging Egyptian and Levantine Arabic in textbooks, this sends the message that these are the most useful dialects, which inadvertently contributes to the marginalization of other varieties of Arabic, especially those found south of Sahara, which are often labeled as not real Arabic or broken Arabic due to their distinct grammatical structure and ways of pronunciation. I have studied Arabic in the US, Morocco, and Jordan with various professors of various backgrounds. However, these issues regarding Arabic language instruction continue to occur. I never felt empowered to talk about my concerns with learning Arabic until moving to Washington DC to pursue my masters or have met other Afro-Arabs or black African students of Arabic who share my feelings of frustration and ina inadequacy in the classroom. This gap in Arabic language instruction further marginalizes historically oppressed groups, especially those individuals who continue to live in the shadow of the legacy of slavery, disenfranchisement, and colonial rule in this part of the world. Last semester, a great friend and colleague of mine in my graduate program sent me an article titled, quote, In Search of African Arabic by Dr. Vaughn Raspberry of Stanford University. I was automatically captivated by a quote found underneath the article's title, which reads, the majority of the world's Arabic speakers inhabit Africa and its diasporas. So why is much of continental Africa absent in Arabic language curricula? In his article, Dr. Raspberry discusses the invisibility of Arabic dialects of, of African dialects of Arabic, sorry, most notably in the Maghreb region, um, for example, Morocco, Algeria, Tunisia, Libya, Mauritania. He takes it a step further by discussing the invisibility of varieties of Arabic found south of the Sahara, such as Hassaniya Arabic, Chadian Arabic, Sudanese, South Sudanese, and South Sudanese Arabic. 
Dr. Raspberry's article had a major impact on me because it made, it made me realize that these gaps in Arabic language curricula are identifiable. His article also reminds us that, quote, these questions for Arabic study are more than academic, end quote, and I'm honored to have him as one of tonight's guest speakers. Often, those who want to learn um, lesser known varieties of Arabic must do a bit of added research uh, on our own outside of the classroom. In doing so, I came across Bentley's YouTube channel. I think most people would agree with me when I say that my jaw dropped when I heard him speak Arabic. I was shocked, a bit confused, so I did more research and looked more into his filmography, and I was pleasantly surprised to find that most of his content centers on his childhood in Chad, where he learned Chadian Arabic, and therefore a large portion of his content is filmed in this dialect. Through Bentley, I also learned Arabic is spoken in Chad, which helped reaffirm my conviction that the Arabic-speaking world is much larger than many of us previously imagined. I'm a huge fan of Bentley's content, and I'm thrilled that he is here with us tonight. The current state of Arabic language instruction makes it so that there's very little room to celebrate the immense diversity of the varieties of Arabic. Therefore, tonight aims to pay homage to this rich language in all of its forms, those who speak it and those who desire to learn it. So without further ado, I will now introduce my two guest speakers for this evening. Dr. Vaughn Raspberry is an Associate Professor of English at Stanford University. Dr. Raspberry studies African American and African diasporan literature, 20th century American fiction, post-colonial theory, and philosophical theories of modernity. He serves as the Director of Academic Programs for Stanford Center for Comparative Studies in Race, Race and Ethnicity. In 2016, Harvard University Press published his first book, Race in the Totalitarian Century, Geopolitics and the Black Literary Imagination, recipient of the American Political Science Association's 2017 Ralph Bunch Award, awarded annually for the best scholarly work in political science on ethnic and cultural pluralism. His book also received a 2017 American Book Award from the Before Columbus Foundation and was shortlisted for the Christian Goss Award from the Phi Beta Kappa Society. He, hold, he holds a PhD from the University of Chicago in English Language and Literature, an MA from the University of Chicago in Humanities, and a BA from Howard University in English Literature and Language, Language and Literature, I'm sorry. Bentley Brown is a PhD candidate in critical media practices at the University of Colorado Boulder. Brown is a filmmaker and musician with research interest in language and technological mediation of memory. His fiction and nonfiction films deal largely with psycholo the psychology of cross-cultural migration and identity, particularly in his childhood home of Chad and later experiences in Sudan, Saudi Arabia, and the United States. Prior to starting his PhD at the University of Colorado Boulder, Brown was a lecturer in filmmaking and interactive media at Efat University in Jeddah, Saudi Arabia. He holds a, an MA in Communications, Culture, and Technology from Georgetown University, Oyasaksa, <laughs> and a BA in International Studies from Emory University. Please join me in virtually welcoming tonight's uh, guest speakers. <laughs> Alrighty, so the next uh, 40 to 45 minutes will be dedicated to um, a few questions that I have proposed for both the guest speakers. Um, you'll have about five minutes to answer each question. And then after the section, we'll go into a larger Q&A um, with everyone else. So my first question is for you both. Uh, I think it's pretty interesting to note that the three of us have all studied Arabic in some formal capacity. Therefore, various academic and personal considerations shape our desire to learn this language. My first question for you all tonight is, why did you decide to learn Arabic? And how do your identities complement or complicate your relationship with the Arabic language and with other Arabic speakers? 
We'll begin with Bentley, maybe. Uh, okay, well, mine, I'll try to keep it brief because I have some more stories to share later on to, inter to inter uh, illustrate things. Uh, thank you, by the way, Nassiri, and thank you to Georgetown. Thank you, everyone, for being here. It's awesome to see all these names uh, here on the attendees. Um, it's a great honor. Uh, I was, uh, I had no option but to learn Arabic. I was forced to learn Arabic as a kid. <laughs> my, my parents told me when uh, I was 10, that we would be nine or 10, that we'd be moving to Chad in North Central Africa. And when I looked it up, I saw that Chad had Arabic and French listed as official languages. And uh, I assumed that I would be learning French because it just seemed that it would be easier to learn closer to English. This is in my like nine year old brain at the time. I arrived in N'Djamena, Chad, and the first things that I learned were all Arabic greetings from family friends of ours, from kids in my neighborhood. Assalamu alaikum, kif haalak, intaafi, all these chatty and greetings, and the rest is history. Um, how it informs who I am today, how does that, how did that sort of relationship continue? I'll get into that in a little bit later, but um, I had this realization that in Chad eventually that not everyone speaks Arabic. It didn't dawn on me until uh, maybe a few months into living in Chad, we were going to a concert. My dad was driving, his friend Jiber was in the, in the front seat and we were pulling into the parking lot. And my dad starts speaking Arabic to the parking attendant, uh, asking, you know, like, where are we gonna park our car? And the attendant can't respond, doesn't speak Arabic, stuttering, can't, can't respond. Uh, our friend Jiber says, wow, like he doesn't even speak Arabic. <laughs> and and I, at that point, I hadn't even realized that there might be people in Chad that don't speak Arabic as a first language. So this opened to me this possibility of learning Arabic to kind of stake my claim to establish my own identity. My brother and I uh, were growing up, eventually we left in Jemena, moved to a, a rural part of Chad called Ati or Atia kind of in the middle on the way to like halfway to Sudan, the Sudanese border on the southern edge of the desert. And in Ati, my brother and I are the only white kids <laughs> and the only other sort of like foreigners would be from Sudan or from Libya or these places. So the way that we could at least attempt to fit in was to learn Arabic. Um, that was my main impetus was to try to fit in with the kids on my soccer team as we're jogging around the soccer field. I'm getting teased a little bit for not speaking Arabic that well. So I wanted to get better to kind of prove myself, prove my own worth among my peers. And eventually that got to a point where we're playing, I guess we played a lot of sports as teenagers, but we're on the basketball court <laughs> um, in this neighborhood called uh, Kartia Arab, which is literally like the Arab neighborhood. So this is people that um, historically would trace their roots to Arabic tribes in this part of Chad. And I realized that it wasn't just my brother and I getting teased for not speaking Arabic well, it was other Chadian kids who were getting teased. Kids who, like our family, had moved to Ati, but many of them came for government jobs or positions that their, their parents were working in the town. So they came from Southern Chad or from Central Chad or other regions of Chad where they were speaking another language as the first language. One of these kids uh, went to uh, it was largely people that had resettled in Atsi or had moved to Atsi. He went to this church. And so this is a Muslim majority town. And he went to this church sort of like literally on the fringes of town, literally on the outside of town. He was getting teased by one of the Arab kids on the basketball court saying, like you guys don't speak good Arabic. And this kid responds to prove his Arabness and says, la la la, all right. And what he means by this, he meant he was saying, or in Chinese Arabic, you might say lucha with a ha, to kind of prove that they have the language, they, they can speak. And unfortunately, that mispronunciation led to more bullying. And this was kind of an eye-opening moment for me where I was like, oh my God, it's not just that everybody doesn't speak Arabic or that there's different tiers of Arabic, but I started to see that being Arab or speaking Arabic was seen as a sign of being a better person in a way, right? It was like a, it was weaponized to, put others down. And so I guess I'll have to, I'll, I'll time out right here and we'll move on. But as I moved later on to Sudan and to Saudi Arabia, I started to see that more and more and it actually related to myself. Touch base in a minute. 
Thank you very much, Bentley. Dr. Raspberry. And uh, thank you everyone for joining us tonight. Thank you so much, Nisreen, for um, hosting this event. And, and Bentley, thank you also for sharing your story with us. Uh, I started to study the Arabic language about seven years ago when I was working on my first book, which you mentioned, uh, Nisreen, Race in the Totalitarian Century. And this book centers mainly on African-American and African diaspora writers, activists, and intellectuals who are engaged in Cold War geopolitical issues and who are traveling the world and forging alliances with other writers and activists. And many of these um, alliances were in Africa, in uh, different parts of, of Western Asia or the Middle East. And it became apparent to me that there was a real problem in my argument and the research, the story that I was telling. Um, in other words, I was able to register how um, African Americans were able to forge these alliances in um, Africa, the Middle East, and elsewhere in the non-Western world, uh, but I was not able to say very much about how those alliances or how those ideas were received in these parts of the world. And that just seemed like a real weakness, and I, and I felt it very strongly as I was writing my book, even though I wasn't really able to correct it. Um, I was too far into the project. And it, you know, I was working on one chapter on W.E.B. Du Bois and uh, his second wife, Shirley Graham Du Bois, who's also a very uh, important, although not uh, very famous writer um, in, in her own right. And in the 1960s, uh, the Du Boises moved to Ghana. Um, Shirley Graham eventually moved to Egypt and she was a Nasserist. She, she wrote about Egyptian politics, um, various topics in, in the Middle East. She wrote about the Palestinian struggle. And you know, it dawned on me that you know, if I really wanted to understand this, this work and how it might have been understood, um, or rather how the people about whom Du Bois was writing um, understood her activism and her uh, writings, then it would be very useful for me to learn uh, a language such as Arabic. And that's, well, that was sort of my motivation. But you know, as I began to um, study the language more, I became more intrigued by how Arabic traveled to the Americas in the course of the transatlantic slave trade. You know, many um, enslaved West Africans who wound up in the Caribbean, in North America and South America, um, possess knowledge of Arabic, you know, as a, as a liturgical language, as a language of learning. You know, we, I don't know if we'll ever really know um, how many people, uh, how many enslaved Africans actually had, you know, were able to read or in, maybe in some cases speak Arabic. Um, you know, there are some estimates, but um, it was really intriguing to me. And as a scholar of, of African-American literature, that you know that fact is not only not widely known, but doesn't really bear heavily on many um, scholar on, on much scholarship of uh, of the slave narrative of um, you know nineteenth century um, American studies, North America or South America. It's kind of a niche scholarly field, and you know I will say you know as uh, I, I am of African and, and European descent. I identify as an African American and I, I have a special interest in the literature of slavery. And it's, it's just an incredibly rich and fascinating topic that um, you know, is, is not widely studied. There's, there's more research emerging on this subject, um, yet it's not really part of any larger public discussion. And it's not a huge subject of the academic literature. Um, although there, you know, again, there, there are um, specialists who have really enlarged our understanding of this history. So that was enough to excite me about this subject. And, and I, I, you know, even though my Arabic is not very good even now, um, and, and um, I approach this subject with uh, tremendous humility, you know, as, a, as I say in my article, I'm, I'm merely a talib, you know, I'm not even, uh, I'm not a specialist or an, an expert in um, African Arabic or even um, 
uh, standard Arabic, but it, um, you know, the, but, but learning more about this history, both the, you know, the way in which Arabic traveled to the Americas in the course of the slave trade, um, the importance of Arabic um, as a multinational language in Africa and beyond was enough to, you know, inflame my imagination and, and, and uh, to in, in, induce me to keep studying, even though my study has been <laughs> um, marked by many setbacks. Uh, but I, I'm really committed to learning the language uh, and, and the richness of, 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 of and the diversity of, of Arabic, as, as we will no doubt discuss further. For sure. Thank you very much for you guys sharing. So my second question is for uh, you, Dr. Raspberry. Um, in your article for Newsline, you touch upon why most students decide to learn the Egyptian or Levantine dialects of Arabic and how some African varieties of the language, especially those spoken south of the Sahara, are often excluded from advanced Arabic language courses and are, quote, seldom regarded as Arabic. You also offer some insight into the status quo in the following passage, which I think is worth quoting at length. Quote, defenders of the status quo in Arabic curricula can point to the historical, the historic cultural capital of Cairo, Beirut, and Baghdad, and increasingly Doha and Riyadh, a self-evident justification for their prominence in the classroom setting. But a pedagogy of prestige, even one bolstered by an instrumental rationale such as workplace preparedness, is out of step with today's ethos and only perpetuates the invisibility of African Arabic." End quote. Can you say more about what you mean by pedagogy of prestige? What alternatives do you envision beyond this pedagogy? And what do you think are the ethos that we should aspire to? Sure, Nisreen, thank you for that question. So here's what I was trying to suggest in that passage. Uh, you know, most cultures and languages have some idea of certain places, cities, regions that are historic incubators of culture, you know, the places where ideas, art, literature, and so on are produced and disseminated. You know, so in Europe, for example, certain nations and cities are imagined as, you know, prominent cultural capitals, Paris, London, Rome, uh, Berlin, Vienna, and so on. Um, obviously, there's a strong association of cultural capitals with like large metropolitan centers. Uh, and so I think the Arabic speaking world is, is not very different in this regard, you know, uh, Cairo, Baghdad, Beirut, and other cities, you know, are rightly seen as, as important and, and majestic cultural capitals. Um, you know, these are prestigious cities with world historical um, significance. And so the Arabic curriculum, you know, intentionally or not, I think reflects the historical importance of these locales. And, and that's probably true of all large global langu languages, as I, as I try to insinuate in, in my essay, you know, Arabic is um, not alone in, in this dynamic. Uh, but I think that, um, you know, so yeah, I think that most institutionalized language curricula are formed with this bias, you know, in mind and, and uh, among other biases, as, as we'll discuss. And I can't prove that necessarily, but that's just my impression uh, as a student of languages, as, you know, as some, someone who's studied uh, various languages in university settings. And uh, so I guess that's what I meant by a pedagogy of prestige. And to your second question, you know, what is a better alternative to this mode of pedagogy? And, you know, that's, that's a question that might be above my pay grade, but I, I don't think it's difficult to imagine a more representative and, and inclusive pedagogy, you know, one that reflects the varieties of, of Arabic spoken North and South of the Sahara. Um, now we all know that you know instruction in standard Arabic, uh, as Nasreen, as you as you attest uh, uh, rightly in, in your opening remarks, you know they make uh, very little space for vernacular forms. Um, you know the forms of Arabic that people actually use in daily life. So you know and that might be a problem in and of itself, as as I know many people have written about uh, exhaustively. Um, but you know when we we, we have to take stock of both the kind of um, 
issues pertaining both to um, the, the prestige associated with certain uh, cultural capitals in the Arabic speaking world on the one hand and um, regimes of anti-blackness on the other that maybe are working in tandem to um, render African Arabic, Black Arabic invisible, you know? And so, you know, what, what kinds of concrete pedagogical reforms or initiatives might be needed to rectify that problem? And that's a big question. And, and someone with, I think, much more expertise than I would have to um, think about, but it's not that complicated, <laughs> you know, where, where, like we, you know, we've all read Al Kitab and, and other standard Arabic textbooks. We know that these uh, other mo modes uh, and vernaculars are are not present. They're not even alluded to. You know, it's it's not just that, you know, the the um, Levantine and and Misri or Egyptian dialects are are the ones that are uh, that tend to be represented. You know, even in examples. Um, the the narratives, you know, that trying to bring the language to life, like we don't, we're not introduced to characters from Mauritania or Chad or Sudan or, um, you know, other countries in the Sahel. Um, and, and that's also maybe true of other um, countries on, on the periphery of, 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 you know, say the, the um, of the Arabic speaking world. Um, <clears throat> So we're, there's a sentence that I that I use that I that I um, have in the essay to the effect that Africa remains a kind of blank space in the geography of Arabic curricula. So we need to fill that space in. <laughs> you know, we need to populate it with characters, with stories, with um, modes of understanding of these these parts of the world. And so that's I think a place to begin. Bentley, would you like to add anything? Um, hmm. Just briefly, uh, I, I mean, I, <clears throat> okay. We have to go to the root of why these dialects are invisible and not acknowledged. And I can only present things that I've observed from my perspective. Uh, and I've even academically, I've seen a little bit, I, I came back from Chad to the US for college. I started college in, at Emory in Atlanta and uh, wanted to study Fusha. So I had studied Fusha growing up in Chad with like uh, a teacher um, to, in order to read and write, but my, my knowledge of Fusha was very basic. So the teachers, the professors at Emory, uh, a couple of which at the time, by the way, are the, are the co-authors of Al-Kitab fi Ta'alam al-Arabiya, which is the book that's being referred to here, uh, gave me this writing assignment to write a paragraph in Fusha talking about myself. And it was a total disaster. I started, I was just like inserting words I had heard on TV that sounded fusha, like fancy or whatever, like qad tafulati, thumma, kanat, absolute, absolute uh, shambles. And I got placed in a second year fusha class, right? Now, when I got placed in that second year fusha class, I had grown up speaking Arabic, a spoken Arabic, a dialect of Arabic. So I realized I had a really big advantage and I was able to actually skip the third year of Arabic and go into fourth year after that. And this raises this question of to what extent does the perceived proximity of dialects to Fusha uh, matter in this conversation of, of pedagogy? Because that's probably the most common reason that I hear people telling me that they maybe they don't, they've never heard of chatting Arabic or they don't understand chatting Arabic or chatting Arabic isn't really useful is that it's uh, in terms of maybe lexicon and let's say a bit of pronunciation, just really it's farther away than their perceived center of, of Arabic. And that perceived center has sort of migrated. Of course, I think it comes hand in hand with the sort of ethno-nationalist, also like religiously rooted uh, notion that Arabic suddenly appeared with a Quran. I know people don't actually believe that, but that's kind of like a line that you hear sometimes that, that like the, the root of Fusha uh, is, is tied to uh, the Quran in some way. So, so a lot of people, I guess, subconsciously start to associate that with uh, some maybe modern day uh, Mecca area or the Hijaz. <laughs> um, but we've also seen a lot of prominence in Egyptian Arabic in the media, even Levantine Arabic, even 
Um, as Dr. Raspberry mentioned in Arabic curricula, Levantine Arabic is often used as a, sort of an example of spoken Arabic. And then increasingly kind of like a, it's like a rebound on a rebound is Gulf, the various Gulf Arabic dialects that uh, they're getting a little bit of uh, limelight and consideration as sort of like an, an essential sort of library of, of Arabic dialects to learn. But you, you definitely don't hear about Chadian <laughs> from my perspective, so. For sure, thank you very much for that answer. That actually like made me think and I would say the same for South Sudanese Arabic um, in terms of, because it's given me kind of an advantage uh, in terms of like learning post how like relatively faster when I was on the CLS Critical Languages Scholarship Program in Morocco, um, I learned how to speak Arabic at a much different rate than my other classmates. Um, although most people had never heard of Arabi Juba and um, even when I had spoken Arabi Juba, most people would be like, that's not, you know, like they, they had a hard time understanding me and things of that nature. And so I think, I mean, there's this like Olympics with like Arabic dialects, you know, the closest to Posha. Um, I mean, granted, like when learning Arabic, you know, if you want to learn MSA as, as well as a, a dialect, it's almost as if you have to learn two different languages. So in order to mitigate that, you want to learn the closest to Posha, but this also just kind of, it, it shouldn't be a competition, you know, it's just like we should celebrate all of them in the rich diversity of the language. And so my next question is actually for you, Bentley. Um, it might come to a surprise to some that Arabic is spoken in Chad. Um, could you talk more about Chad's sociolinguistic landscape more generally and how Arabic fits into it? For example, where is Arabic spoken and by whom? So Chadi and Arabic, I, I like to really sum summarize it, probably not do it justice, but uh, when I when I left Chad for Sudan after college, it was like my first job out of college. I found Sudan to be kind of like a Chad 2.0. So if you're familiar with Sudan, with this sort of talk about the north and the south, and the north being where Arabic is the presumed first language, um, or at least the trade language, that's a, that's fairly true for Chad. That northern Chad uh, is a place where you would just meet upon meeting a stranger, you would uh, assume that you would speak Arabic. And as you go to southern Chad, uh, that Arabic's prevalence is a lot less. The, the French colonialism in Chad is a little bit uh, different of a story than what happened in Sudan by comparison. Uh, and I guess I have a little part I've written here. It's the most, the most riveting thing is to do is to read from your draft of your PhD. But if, if you can bear with me, I think this sums it up right here. So unlike Sudan, whose post-independence Arabization movement removed the colonial English from school curricula and government administration, Chad still retained French as its primary national language with modern standard Arabic as a far second. The result of this at the individual level is that the abstract ideas are largely expressed and encouraged in French while day-to-day -day is very much the territory of Arabic. So while many of my friends are from Arab tribes, they speak Chadian Arabic as their first language and are even fluent in the greater Arabic media landscape, watching Al Jazeera for news, for example, maybe li listening to Lebanese or Egyptian pop music. To write an essay, they would almost certainly revert to French. I argue that the lack of an Arabic language sort of uh, intellectual community has detrimental effects on Arab Arabophone Chadians' ability to not only engage with the global Arabic speaking community, but to even express themselves in Arabic at the abstract level. And I, I personally suffered from that. In this case, the French colonial legacy has left French as the gatekeeper for sharing ideas with the outside world, which in turn nips in the bud any chance of subverting French with Arabic due to the scarcity of resources and MSA at the educational level. But I also argue this thing where uh, like my friend's fluency in French from the language to the philosophy to the, the values that accompany it exhibits an ownership of French as valid as anyone else's. And that includes France itself and the idea of like Francais de Souche and its, its own level of, of, of hierarchies over there in France. And that the rare, the rare few who exhibit fluency in Chadian Arabic, MSA and French have this multicultural fluency 
that negates the traditional east-west binary and transverses multiple worlds, Arab, African, and European. So in short, Arabic is less used in the government and educational system in Chad because French kind of won out, sort of won that race. Chad never had an Arabization period such as that in post-colonial Sudan with Nimeri and, and, and uh, a handful of other leaders. When I go to Sudan, immediately I have this realization that my accent sounds Sudanese, but a lot of the words I'm drawing from are, uh, are, are not as Sudanese. And basically what that means is that I'm actually using the sort of either just chatting Arabic terms um, as opposed to operating on the diglossia of pulling from full every time I don't know the Sudanese term for something, uh, or I, my brain just goes blank because I'm used to using the French word to express in that particular sense. And it's not like, I do want to challenge people that say, oh, North Africa just speaks French. Like they don't, their Arabic isn't real Arabic, it's just French. Uh, I, I think that often across many parts of Northern Africa, uh, people are, are bilingual or maybe trilingual and are actually uh, interchanging and code switching with French. So they have, they can choose the Arabic or the French term. In Chad, for example, if I say, I'm speaking with you guys, my Arabic sentence would be, all right? But I could use a French word at any point, especially if I wanted to sort of add a little abstract, abstractification of that, of that phrase, right? So take the French infinitive, add the Arabic prefix to it, and, and that, that works. Now in chat in Sudan, that doesn't really happen with English. The level of code switching, there's some code switching with English, but it, at least in younger Sudanese people that I've met under, let's say people born like after the 80s and, and 90s, uh, usually going to uh, revert to just, just Arabic. So that's a key difference. Professor Osbury, would you like to add anything? Um, well, let me see. Um, I, I would agree with with Bentley. I mean, the the um, the degree of code switching in uh, the Maghreb is evident in daily life, um, and a lot of uh, people from you know Morocco, Tunisia, Algeria, um, perhaps Mauritania, and um, elsewhere are also. Um, in my ex limit, very limited experience, also quite proficient in Fusha, so they can kind of not only code switch, but um, let me let me put it differently. So I I do think that there is a great deal of French vocabulary that has just been sort of imported into um, the Maghrebi dialects, you know. Um, but I was struck by how proficient, you know. Um, people are in Fusha as well. I, I expect it to sound like a complete stranger. So, I, you know, I just, I, I was so scared to speak standard Arabic in, in, in this context because it, I just thought it would sound ridiculous. And it probably does, but, you know, um, the, the, I'm, I was just struck by the ability of you know, speakers in this context to kind of meet you where you are, <laughs> wherever on the Arabic spectrum you find yourself. That's just a personal observation, um, not an academic one. But I'll, I'll stop there because I know there are more questions. <laughs> well, my next question is actually for you. Um, so as I read your article, the place of Arabic in South Sudan came to mind. Um, in South Sudan, uh, Juba Arabic functions as the primary lingua franca amongst this country's multi-ethnic population. However, it is not recognized as an official language in any capacity. The reluctance of some South Sudanese nationals to fully embrace Arabic, even in its creolized form, stems from this nation's history of slavery and marginalization under Egyptian and Sudanese colonial rule. All of this came to mind when I read your discussion when I raised a discussion of the debate of whether or not Arabic should be regarded as an external language or even a colonial one on the continent. You raise issues of indigeneity, decolonization, and history in relation to the Arabic language. I don't really know what my question here is, is exactly, but I'm interested in hearing from both of you on your thoughts on these issues. And I do want to also um, recognize the fact that 
Arabic and histories and, and especially in terms of like slavery uh, differ very greatly. Um, we we're talking about a con you know half of a continent and then another region, uh, um, meaning like Southwest Asia. And so I just want to uh, let viewers know that uh, I'm very cognizant in the fact that slavery has manifested itself in like very different ways. Um, however, my question is primarily in the context of South Sudan. I don't know to what extent you guys are both familiar with the context, but um, yeah, this was just a, a thought I thought about when I read your article. Thank you, Nisreen. And my response uh, to your to your remark, I know it's not exactly a question, but I would say just immediately that, you know, it's certainly not for me to define what constitutes an indigenous language in Africa. Um, I think that's for Africans themselves to define. Um, and what I would say is that I think that there is a plurality of views on that topic. Um, you know, there are some views that I think are maybe more linguistic in nature that characterize Arabic, if, if not as an indigenous language as such, as not external, uh, not foreign to continental Africa, that, it, that at least one of the tributaries of, of, of Arabic is African or at least derives from the traffic between Northeast Africa and um, the Arabian Peninsula. Now, I'm not in a position to judge the linguistic merits of that argument. I just know that it, it exists. Now, of course, there are other views that see Arabic quite differently and um, view the language as external, as in some cases even colonial, um, but definitively not African. Um, and you know, there's a there's a passage that I um, have in the essay um, that I think kind of illuminates the ways in which some African thinkers regard Arabic on the continent. You know, so at the um, at a very important literary conference in the early 1960s um, that featured numerous uh, very now very famous African writers, uh, including Ngugi Wationg O, Chinua Achebe, these very you know, well-known luminaries of African uh, literature. The question of language is extremely important. Um, and so the question has to do with, you know, what is the shape of African literature in the post-colonial moment, in the moment of African independence? Should, the, should African literature be written exclusively in African languages or in some African languages, as well as in European languages? What constitutes African literature? And um, I thought that uh, one remark by uh, Chinua Achebe was, was really uh, revealing, you know, he, he suggested, or he asked, he said, you know, should the literature in independent Africa embrace the whole continent or south of the Sahara or just black Africa? And then he writes, you know, and then the question of language, should it be an indigenous African languages or should it include Arabic, English, French, Portuguese, Afrikaans, etc.? And I thought that was revealing because by lumping Arabic along with European colonial languages, I mean, that I think indicates maybe not only how he perceives the Arabic language, but maybe also how his audience and his interlocutors did as well. Um, I know that's just one view, but I know it's maybe widely shared by some on the continent. But I think what is also interesting is, you know, a, a, a linguistic question about when and how does a language become indigenous uh, and when it becomes foreign? You know, that, that terrain shifts over time. The perception of a language as indigenous um, or as foreign uh, is really, is historically, is, is historical in nature and it, it isn't fixed forever and all time. You know, there are different perceptions depending on the specific historical situation. You know, and I think Arabic is no different. Um, but I, I am also really intrigued by what seems to me to be the liminal status um, of Africa. You know, th I think there's no doubt that it's an Ar that it's that Arabic is an African language, if by for no other reason, um, by virtue of the fact that it is has been spoken on the continent for a millennium and is, and is, you know, spoken is one of the most widely spoken um, uh, languages on the continent. You know, but but 
how African, how indigenous, you know, and or how external is, I think, obviously a matter for debate and for, for Africans themselves to um, determine. Thank you. Bentley, would you like to add anything? Well, I think Dr. Raspberry hit the nail on the head there. That that conference, the Makareri University Conference, um, I, I keep forgetting that that happened was like 1962 or something, as countries were getting independence from the European uh, colonizing forces. So, so these questions, today we're reflecting on them sort of on this, like, you know, oh, at the individual level, does an African writer perceive Arabic as an African language or not? Like, is it, do you, do you lose something of your identity when speaking in uh, a language that came from the outside? But at that time, they're actually right at the cusp of uh, the colonial powers, at least uh, in, in uh, terms of military force and, and government and whatnot, uh, leaving, leaving the continent. And Ngugi Wationgo also writes about this, I think at the beginning of decolonizing the mind and asked that question, even if, you know, there are people that were already considering the European languages to be, have been sort of adopted and owned by the writers who were writing in languages like English, French, and Portuguese. The, I think there was something about the conference where you had to have like a paper published in English to even get in or to be, to be accepted. So uh, in his opinion, he said people were basically missing the mark. They're sitting here debating whether or not Arabic is an outside language or not, and not realizing uh, that, that everybody there was, was ha already having to perform in, in some fluency in an outside language just to sort of be heard, right? So for me, I'm, I'm not a huge fan of uh, uh, nationalisms in general. And I, I, I think that at this point in our history, we have so much movement uh, even in terms of, you know, dual and, and multicultural, multinational identity, that I really do respect the decision to have this choice of what language, you know, can I use or what language, you know, can, do, I, do I feel I have the authority to write in? Um, what do I consider to be uh, part of my, my upbringing or, or, or not? I like to leave that at the individual level as well. For sure. Thank you very much. Um, my fifth question is for E. Bentley. Um, your films center on cross-cultural migration, disidentification, and belonging in your childhood home of Chad, and then later experience, experiences elsewhere. You are also very active on social media with nearly 30,000 followers on Instagram, 115,000 followers on TikTok, and 47,000 subscribers on YouTube. A remarkable aspect of your filmography and social media posts is that you can be seen speaking Chadian or Sudanese Arabic in most of your content. What is your response to people who claim that Chadian Arabic is, quote, broken Arabic, as so many of sub-Saharan varieties of the language are often called? And if possible at all, could you talk about kind of some of the, the origins of why Chadian Arabic could potentially be viewed as broken in the first place? Woo, okay, it's a big one. See me a time limit. Just start waving frantically when I when I go overboard here. Well, first of all, in Chad, just like with every other country we've mentioned, and these countries, these nation states are recent phenomena. There's several dialects of Arabic. So I was already, as I mentioned, alluded to earlier, when my family moved from Enjamana in Western Chad to Central Chad to Ati, I was already going through uh, a, an adjustment to a new Arabic dialect within Chad. And my uh, proficiency or lack thereof in that dialect kind of related to my my buy-in and ownership and being respected among my peers. So that's already within Chad. Now, where I grew up in Atsi, we looked up to Sudan a lot. There was kind of a Sudanese cultural influence, you might call it. Listen to almost strictly Sudanese music growing up. Sudanese stand-up comedians had audio tracks that we would pass around on CD. And to this day, a lot of Sudanese TikTok humor, a lot of videos on WhatsApp, they make their way into the chatty and WhatsApp circles. And with that, there's this elevation of Sudanese Arabic. Now, that's, when I talk about this with a lot of Sudanese friends, they find it ironic because that's kind of like a microcosm of what a lot of people I've, I've heard of have experienced going from Sudan to other Arabic speaking countries. And I really respect the distinction uh, Nisreen, of not just saying Arab countries, 
but saying Arabic speaking countries, because all of these countries have people who are citizens, or maybe they're not citizens, they should be citizens, <laughs> don't speak Arabic, or don't speak Arabic as a first language, or who do speak Arabic, <laughs> the whole diversity is out there, but who do not identify as Arab. So it's very important to say Arabic speaking countries, I really respect that. So, so going to the Gulf, uh, it's, this, it's this mixed bag where you know, people don't even know Chadian speak Arabic. So they hear me open my mouth and they, they assume that I, I speak you know, just Sudanese Arabic. And to be fair, I'm adjusting my Arabic. Every time I go another country over, I have to adjust my Arabic, otherwise I won't be understood, period. So it's interesting you say I speak Chadian Arabic on social media. To be honest, I lean way more Sudanese and maybe Hijazi Arabic in a lot of videos because if I, if I just spoke Chadian Arabic, no one, no one would really understand, which is a very interesting point. That could, that, that could be used as sort of a counter argument against what we're talking about today in a, in a sense, right? So in, in Saudi Arabia, the reaction to my Arabic accent is usually like, you know, really quickly people are like, oh my God, you know, so like, I don't look like I would be speaking Arabic that sounds like this. And what they mean is, you know, like from Sudan or Westbound, or maybe we could say black or whatever, whatever it is. In that moment, there's either this like fascination and respect that gets matched with that, or the more common one, it's kind of a, it's kind of funny, right? It's kind of like, a, uh, it's like a quirky thing. And I'll hear people say things like, oh yeah, I had a Sudanese teacher in high school, or I had a Sudanese friend growing up or whatever. And they also pronounce, you know, gumur like you do. They say it again, you know, that kind of stuff, right? Um, so why do people view chatting Arabic as broken? I would say it's a lack of familiarity, but it's, there's also some, there's been some kind of, uh, pyramid constructed in which things that aren't familiar must be farther away from this perceived root, the central root of what Arabic and what Fusa is. That's my, that's my guess at it. I've been told I was on a TV interview in the Gulf and the reporter interrupted me mid-sentence after I said I grew up in Chad and she said, oh, uh, so, <laughs> so like I hadn't said anything that was like bizarre or really weird. It's just that that accent to her sounded maybe unfamiliar and too far from a perceived center. That would be my guess. One thing I compare it to maybe would be like Caribbean dialects of English that a lot of Americans in this sort of like maybe white normative, you know, so to, be, to be American is to sound a certain way. If you hear someone coming from a Caribbean island, they assume that that person speaks that language as a second language or third language whereas they might be speaking it as a first language. That's, that's a comparison that I've used for, for chatting Arabic and, and might be relevant for South Sudanese Arabic and stuff as well, going to other Arabic speaking countries. Very interesting points. I mean, um, in South Sudan, um, in Arabi Juba, we don't have feminine, so everything is masculine. So I'd say Anajahiz, not Anajahiza, as most uh, dialects um, have that feminine. So I think it's, it's very interesting um, in thinking about, you know, the root of like these perceptions of these like dialects as being broken or not real Arabic and things of that nature. Um, I obviously don't have the question um, or the answer to my question, although, um, you know, I think this is something for us to continue to think about um, um, and hopefully uh, individuals will continue the conversation after this webinar ends. Um, my very final question for the both of you is, what do you hope those who watch uh, tonight's conversation will take away? Um, I'll start with Professor Osbury. Sure, sure. So, um, well, tuning in is, the, is, is a great start. You know, I'm, I'm really encouraged to see all the people who came out on, um, you know, I, I, um, I wrote I wrote this essay again with some trepidation because I said you know who am I to produce um, this argument you know who am I to launch into this world that I'm really just beginning to learn um, you know but I I was compelled to do so because I was looking around for some I, I would have hoped that someone you know a scholar a writer someone with 
real roots or um, research credentials would have identified the problem for me, you know, but I didn't encounter it, you know, so I, 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 I hope that it's seen as a problem, you know, that it's something that people who are learning the ling language, students who are in Arabic classrooms, who um, maybe want to travel to the Arabic speaking world will, um, you know, start this conversation, you know, raise this, raise this question with your instructors, you know, make it, a, make it something, make it a topic of conversation in your departments. Um, you know, it, the, the, you know, I, I also came at this topic from the pers that from the perspective of Black Studies. You know, so maybe I tend to think about, you know, these kinds of questions through the lens of racialization, and, um, you know, I I hope that um, the conversation will 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 blossom in a way that will compel teachers of the Arabic language, institutions, universities, Marquez de Lorat, you know, language centers to think, of, think hard about their curricula and what's included, what's excluded and how that shapes people's perceptions. You know, so that is, if, if that conversation uh, can, can be initiated, um, then I think that's a, a wonderful start, you know, because as far as I can tell, you know, there's a scholarly conversation that deals with the history of um, Arab, the Arabic language in Africa that deals with some of the more kind of academic issues that I referred to earlier. But, you know, I, again, I'm coming from just a basic, <laughs> you know, an old guy who's in the classroom again and seeing something that I'm wondering if, you know, my students are aware of, or, you know, students, not my students, but students who are also in these classrooms with me. And I wonder if the instructors are uh, aware of it. And so, um, you know, I, I, I hope that they will use this conversation as an opportunity to raise it where, wherever they are in the world and wherever they are in their studies and whatever their aspirations are with the Arabic language. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Rothbury, yeah, I, re I resent your use of the word of the old old guy uh, term here. You got you have me a little horrified myself. Um, I, I would say if we can move on from this conversation and at the interpersonal level deal with more efforts to understand and to act with grace in interactions with people who speak different Arabic dialects. Very simple it sounds, but I cannot tell you how many times people have said some really weird shit to me <laughs> just because of my Arabic accent. I'm coming from other Arabic speaking countries and uh, I would love to be more welcoming and to have others welcome uh, as well. And, and to be honest, like it's, it's a, it is a challenge, right? Because we're accustomed to certain standards of Arabic or certain ideas of what it means to speak Arabic fluently and what dialect sounds a certain way or what sounds more correct and whatnot. And I, I had some time adjusting in Sudan when I arrived there, like I mentioned before, my accent was very close to Sudanese, but my lexicon was different in a lot of ways. And I had, I had some embarrassing examples, embarrassing times. I was working in this office where there were several uh, women had actually been, I noticed for like several days, they had color coordinated their tarhas and like eyeshadow, and lipstick, all kinds of same color. So like on Tuesday, it's green. Wednesday, it's purple. Thursday, it's red. And so we're literally at this like water cooler at the office. And I was like, mashallah, into aliyom, yani nasakhtu lubas, what is, you know? And lubas is a word that in Chinese Arabic just means clothes. It's like malabis, but don't say malabis. Uh, it's a secondary word after like hulgan, right? And lubas and Sudanese Arabic in that particular area, at least, meant underwear. So I had, uh, instead of asking my colleagues, oh, this is cool, you guys color coordinated your clothes? I said, oh, this is cool. Do you like color coordinate your underwear as well? Uh, and that's a, that's a tough one to get out of and definitely a learning, learning lesson. But coming from chatting Arabic, there's no way I would know. <laughs> there's just no way. I remember going back to Chad for vacation from Sudan and the feeling of after living in Sudan for a year, year and a half, boarding a market truck from was it like Subdigel in Jemena to drive 10 hours to Ati eastbound and starting to hear the accents in that car that beyond just being in Jemena, being back in Chad, that I heard these accents of people to the town I'm going to, the town where I grew up. And 
I heard things that I hadn't said in a year and a half because I was trying to sound more Sudanese and sort of like mute myself. And it was very freeing and affirming to hear those things said again and that they weren't incorrect and they weren't broken and they weren't wrong. Wow, thank you guys so much for your wonderful responses to my questions. Uh, now we will open up the floor up uh, for question and answer for the next 15 minutes-ish. Um, I do have a few questions. Um, so the very first question, either of you guys could answer this. Um, oh, the first one is actually for Professor Osbury. Um, when I read the book, uh, Spoken Soul, The Story of Black English by Rick Hurd and Rick Hurd uh, years ago, I wondered if the Arabic language from enslaved Africans had influenced AAVE. Wow, that's an excellent question. I wish I knew the answer to it. I, I, I will relay it to my, my dear colleague, John Rickford, who actually is the author of that book, our co-author, and uh, this, the, that is the standard um, textbook on African-American vernacular English. I'm not sure if he takes up that question or if there is any other research on um, what extent, on what extent, if any, um, Arabic influenced what came to be known as Black English, African American vernacular English. Um, you know, I, I, I don't, I don't know. You know, and I. What's what's hard to ascertain is the degree to which West Africans were actually speaking Arabic uh, or using it primarily as a liturgical language or a language of commerce and um, other forms of communication. It's it's not you know other scholars may may know the answer to this question. I do not. My impression is that it was maybe you know as Islam spread in West Africa, Arabic was not necessarily widely spoken, um, but those who benefited from a Quranic education would have access to the language. So I'm not sure if it would have influenced spoken English among Black Americans. Um, what is interesting to me, however, is how Arabic was in some ways like a secret language for those who had access to it. And it was not accessible to the slave master. You know, um, They may not have had an opportunity to write the language or even to speak it very much, um, but, but some uh, enslaved Africans did possess knowledge of Arabic and it, it it did, I think, distinguish them in the eyes of, of others, particularly white slave owners. And um, that's, a, that's a topic that also fascinates me. You know, um, there's a growing research on this. One of the most uh, important books was published some 20 years ago by uh, Ronald Judy, who is a uh, literature professor at the University of Pittsburgh. And um, his book, well, gosh, I don't, I don't want to miss <laughs> cite his book incorrectly, um, but he was one of the early scholars to uh, write about the African Arabic slave narrative, and more recently, other scholars have joined suit. Um, so that is one way to think about how Arabic circulated and functioned in this context, how it actually impacted spoken English, I'm not so sure. Great. Thank you very much. Um, this next question could probably be for Bentley. Um, do you think that the internet is increasing the visibility of non-normative varieties of Arabic? Your YouTube channel um, and TikTok and Instagram might be a good example of this. Will the internet break down some of the diglossia barriers between fusha and dialects? Okay, in terms of the diglossia barriers, not really sure about that one, right? Because people that even that use uh, dialects extensively in social media posts might not view that as appropriate for, let's say, academic or intellectual, right, or whatever formal writing you have. 
terms of using the internet as a place to distill some of these misconceptions about various uh, quote unquote obscure or more fringe Arabic dialects geographically far from that perceived center, hell yes. <laughs> Um, although it has, it does risk being a little uh, gimmicky sometimes. I mean, a lot of the videos that people circulate that I've made, the reaction is more like, uh, hey, look at this guy, look at this white guy speaking Arabic. And then, oh, wow, such a, like a bizarre dialect of Arabic. I can't believe they speak Arabic in Chad. And then it's just a bunch of like Chadians and non-Chadians arguing over whether or not Chadians are Arab in the comments. <laughs> so um, it's a little bit surface level, but I think that may be a first step into familiarization. It's like the, I don't like the word foreigner or even I be in Arabic. We don't have an option in Arabic, but I don't like the word foreigner because it's immediately immediate otherization. You're saying that's, that's not me. That's different than me. And, and also something's foreign in as much that you don't know about it. You're not familiar with it. So I really respect ways that there are steps that people can take to start to become familiar with what was previously foreign. And I mean, TikTok is a good way to do that. Thank you both. Um, the next question is, how do you recommend teaching Arabic to first time learners who are not specializing in any country or region of the MENA? Would teaching Fosha be the most appropriate way to tackle that? What alternatives would you suggest? Uh, that's the million dollar question, isn't it? I mean, every beginning student kind of has to figure that out, you know, and it, I don't think that there's a one size fits all answer because, you know, the, the, the course of language study that one pursues, I think will depend on how you want to use the language, what kind of communities you want to engage with, what are your, what, you know, what are your aspirations with the language? Um, you know, the, the, the general advice one receives when you start out with Arabic is to, you know, study Fusha initially, and once you achieve a certain level of proficiency, then to, you know, branch out into spoken forms. That seems pretty sound advice. You know, some people um, go straight to a vernacular. They're maybe not interested in reading and writing or, you know, understanding the news media or something like that. So I don't really think that there's a, um, a, a, a one size fits all. But, you know, I would, I would, I would encourage someone, like, let's say you're, you're starting out with standard Arabic. Um, and you, you want to, you know, expose yourself to the different um, Arabic vernaculars, you know, it, you know, as you're learning, um, the st you know, standard Arabic, and, and go beyond the ones that are just in Al-Kitab or whatever textbook, you know, is um, on offer. Um, I, I noticed in one of the uh, comments or the Q&A, someone mentioned that there's a revised um, ish, you know, version of Al Kitab that you know features like Mauritanian Arabic or something like that. So that's encouraging. I didn't know that, you know. So I, I would, you know, it, it it might be difficult to to access, you know, some of these um, uh, other vernaculars, particularly uh, in in on the African continent uh, and particularly south of the Sahara. But I would encourage you to kind of, you know. Um, utilize like the kind of resources that Bentley offers and, and others who are um, in some ways like superseding the Arabic classroom, you know, like if it weren't for the kinds of resources that Bentley and other people are offering, like how would someone like me even get a chance to hear, you know, Chadian or Sudanese Arabic? We say it certainly won't be from the standard textbooks, right? It, we, it won't be, it won't be there. So you have to kind of have some initiative. So, you know, use the technology, use the resources on offer. There, there are different kinds of apps that will connect you with um, native speakers in other, you know, in, in other parts of the world. Um, so, so, you know, like the, the Arabic classroom is a fine place to begin. These textbooks, you know, some of them are, you know, the quality maybe varies. I'm not a huge fan of Al-Kitab, but, you know, it does have its function. Whatever, whatever kind of standard tools you're using, you know, be a little creative, be curious and, and, and use other resources, whether it's social media or other kinds of technologies that can connect you with these speakers or at least, at least give you access to them. Um, outside of the standard classroom, because if you if you remain within the standard curriculum or the standard you know the typical classroom, you're you're not going to get um, much um, exposure to these other vernaculars. Although I hope that's changing. 
Yeah, Arabic learning, like any language learning, is a lifelong process. I mean, no one was born speaking a language that I know of. <laughs> um, <laughs> Uh, so every language that you speak, you're you're continually dealing with it and learning, and you're being affected by that process throughout. And for me, even in my like moving into my adult years, moving into to Sudan, later on to Saudi Arabia, being able to be exposed to different Arabic dialects is very educational. I was very lucky actually to be able to spend significant amounts of time in those two countries. So I'm going eastbound from Chad. And each of those dialects to me sounded close enough to what I was familiar with that it was very welcoming. I landed in Sudan on day one, people were very embracing. It's a very warm welcome <laughs> to Sudanese Arabic. I go to Saudi Arabia, Jeddah, day one, people are embracing and, and bringing me along. They, they know that I speak a different dialect, but we're close enough that we can kind of build on the, the, and learn from the differences there. And I found that process very fruitful. I'm actually upset with my brother and my mom and dad that they only lived in Chad as Arabic speaking countries. And although they traveled to Egypt and Jordan and other places uh, and Saudi Arabia as well, they didn't spend really long, amount, long enough amounts of time to be able to sort of analyze one's own lexicon and see where does my Chadian word die out and where does another word sort of begin. And that could be a really, really helpful thing in sort of mapping out one's own knowledge of Arabic as a whole, as sort of like a greater whole. I've also seen some really cool and creative initiatives as well. Um, whereas I have some, I have a couple friends who in their adult lives, they started learning Arabic and the fact that they spent a year in Palestine and then a year in Dubai and then a year in Morocco, I, I would argue it didn't help them as much because at that time they were still uh, at, a, at a, such a, a raw stage of learning that they were always being caught off guard and people kind of teasing them about, oh, you sound Palestinian, but you're in you know, Dubai now, what's up with that? Uh, I, it wasn't at that level where they would really pick up on the differences as, as uh, speedily as you'd like. But I've seen some cool initiatives in this. I've seen classes offered, workshops. Um, I had a class in Arabic dialectology at Emory taught by uh, Dr. Benny Hari, who, who every week, all we did was go through a transcript of a different Arabic dialect that we, we may not have really known, but we're just looking at these transcripts, talking through, and we had several Arabic speakers from different dialects in that room, uh, as well as newcomers and new learners, and we're able to um, sort of spend time with different dialects one at a time. And I thought that was really, really cool. So there's some really nice ways to get creative with it as well. Yeah, no, for sure. Thanks for, thanks for sharing. The next question for you both is, um, someone uh, writes, I'm conducting research on Swahili culture and language. The Arabification of Swahili, the language, is something that is often cited. I wonder, is there any evidence of the Swahilification of Arabic? That's an excellent question. And I, I am very curious about that very same question. Uh, I don't know the answer, but I, I agree completely. You know, there's a lot of research that um, discusses, analyzes the influence of Arabic on Swahili, and there's also there's also you know a widespread perception that um, Swahili is a kind of derivative of Arabic, and and that's not true. Um, and you know, even it's like I even remember reading a book by um, Hannah Arendt, the very well-known um, German intellectual, and a kind of offhanded comment about Swahili as just a kind of um, bastard tongue of Arabic or something like that. And it's just striking to me how, you know, this sort of, you know, renowned intellectuals can make really ignorant comments and it somehow doesn't, you know, um, mitigate their influence in the world, you know, but that's actually, not true, but she's really, you know, voicing a, a widespread misconception as far as I know, and I don't speak Swahili, although I'm actually interested in learning that language as well. Um, but my point is that, and, 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 as, and as, as I think that this uh, question um, is also getting at, does, does that influence run in both directions? You know, no doubt Arabic has influenced Swahili as, as also many other languages, uh, you know, Persian, Hindi, um, 
have also, you know, in other European languages, German have influenced Swahili. But seldom do scholars ask, has Swahili influenced, for example, Omani Arabic? You know, Oman was an empire that, con that controlled large swaths of East Africa. Um, and, you know, in, in fact, some Omanis speak Swahili, you know, I, and I don't know if that's very widely known either. So I wonder, you know, has the Swahili language influenced Omani Arabic, for example? Um, I don't know the answer to that question, but that seems to me a very fertile ground for research in, in linguistics and, um, you know, the, the literary landscape of uh, the, the Indian Ocean world of which Oman was a um, major part. So it's a great question. I wish I knew the answer, but I'm, I'm, I'm very like-minded in my, my curiosity about it. I think that question can be extended to other languages as well. Um, to modern day uh, Hindi, Urdu also affecting Arabic, especially in the Gulf. Uh, I only spent two days in Oman. I remember hearing Swahili in those two days. And I also remember hearing some Arabic accents that had uh, Swahili elements to them. Um, and yeah, the Thawram and Baid revolution from afar screened at the Zanzibar International Film Festival last year. And I went there expecting to hear like all this mix of Arabic and Swahili. And it wasn't as clear cut as you, you would assume. I really found people that were speaking Arabic or people that were speaking sort of like Swahili that sounded like Swahili I'd heard in mainland Tanzania uh, or Kenya previously. Um, but these are good questions. And I would, I would say that the reason that they're not acknowledged or sort of celebrated as, as intellectual endeavors is not, I mean, we're gonna probably on the scale of like blatant dismissal of you know, we perceive these things to be irrelevant or not fruitful for us because it doesn't fit with our neat construct of pure Arabic and fusha, right? Um, to maybe just a uh, lack of general curiosity and support for those endeavors. And I think that would be something that would be beautiful for people to undertake is to accept the fact or the idea that Arabic is and all the dialects are very dynamic. They're always changing and evolving. And maybe it's, I personally think it's something very cool and beautiful that they have these both historical and recent influences and exchanges. Well said, well said. And the very last question for the night, um, given that we have three minutes, uh, this one's for you, Buckley, actually. Um, as a filmmaker, what do you think the role of filmmaking could be in the reconstruction of linguistic norms in the Arabic speaking world? Oh, man. Oh, okay, so my, my personal response is that I don't see enough, I don't see many filmmakers enough as a judgmental. I don't see many filmmakers embracing sort of a diversity of Arabic dialects or identity in Arab filmmaking today, as, as that I, I would have expected. Art is a place that you can offer the provocative, where you can express things that are not currently part of the, of the common discourse or vernacular. And I would be really excited to see films that would play around with that and sort of push the space of what is a, what's a, 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 an identity worth having dignity, right? Among many Arabic speaking communities. Part of this might be this sort of anti-colonial, decolonial movement we, we've been in for decades, although it, to many, it seems like it just started in 2020 in which, okay, Arabic filmmaking is globally not in the spotlight. Right, so globally every year with the Oscars, we don't have almost any entries from let's say the African continent, right? For like best foreign or international, these stupid terms, <laughs> film. Definitely don't have it for best picture. Um, and that would include the Arab world, Arabic speaking world as well. Uh, so in a, in a sense, a lot of filmmakers are trying to correct these global wrongs, like at the global level, right? The fact that like Arabic speaking filmmaking is not really out there in mainstream cinemas in other continents, in North America, uh, South America, Europe, uh, Eastern, let's say Eastern Asia and, and whatnot. That's something that needs to be corrected. So it's very noble then to, to go out and to make something in, in Arabic. That's, that's it, like you've already done your duty. So you have a, a story about, you know, a uh, single guy struggling to get married among societal norms that are, okay, great, that's, that's a movie, right? But things that go deeper into 
the ideas of acceptance of a diversity of identities, I haven't really seen it touched on that much. Um, I would say the exception might be at the world of essay and experimental film, but there are, are many filmmakers uh, starting to get into these things in that area. And that's pretty cool. It's, it's hard to find those films. So it's a great question because it's, it's like at first I want to say, oh yeah, media, filmmaking, art. Yeah, just share your message. But it's not that simple. I don't know if people are, are really willing to, to hear these things yet. For sure. And that thought, we conclude uh, this event. Thank you very, very much one last time to Dr. Ron Raspberry and Bentley Brown for being with us tonight. I also would like to just say that um, I just wanted this event to, I didn't expect us to have all the answers. Um, a lot of we have, there's just a lot more exploring that uh, we all need to do on an individual level and as a collective. And so I just hope that this is the start of many conversations about how to make Arabic language learning inclusive um, and uh, the role that we all have in embracing um, all varieties of Arabic in whatever shape uh, or form they come in. So again, thank you guys so, so much for being with us tonight. Thank you so much to our guests and I hope that everyone has a great night.